And now we're here at the International Conservative uh, Conference in Tel Aviv with Jason Greenblatt, former envoy of the Trump administration to the Middle East. Shalom. Shalom. Great to be here. And of course, author of In the Path of Abraham. And first of all, I want to ask you about all these endorsements that you got. Give me a, a, a taste of the, the list of endorsements. I was very lucky. Besides the administration, and that would include President Trump, Vice President Pence, Mike Pompeo, Jared, Nikki Haley, H.R. McMaster, and others, I got, and of course Ron Dermer from Israel, I got Arab endorsements as well. So the Foreign Minister of Qatar, the UAE Ambassador to the U.S., and the Bahraini Ambassador to the U.S. So really a widespread uh, cross-section of thoughts and uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because it's interesting, because many people said about the Abraham Accords that each side has their own interests and the other thoughts, and every person has their every side has their own ideas why they're going ahead with this. But you're saying that when you present your side of the story or the way you look, and we'll talk about that momentarily, they endorse that as well. That means it, it's about the depth of the Abraham Accords, not just about who gets the sign which deal and who will earn more money from it. Right. I don't think, for example, the foreign minister of Qatar endorsed the policies that I put forth in my book. In fact, his endorsement is clear, and he says, I don't agree with Jason on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but that's okay. But he understands that we approach this with sincerity, with devotion to seeking peace, and he was willing to try to um, allow us to send that message so people could think more deeply about the conflict. Now, when you talk about the conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you talk a lot about the myths. And is it true that the myths have been, you know, vaporized, or is it just during the Trump and Netanyahu time, there's one way to think about it, but now they're back? Well, there's definitely falling back. There's no question about it, and that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to explain to people what we learned the three years that I was at the White House, why so many of the things being thrown around are inaccurate. Let's take East Jerusalem as a question. Everybody keeps saying, I mean, maybe not you, not me, but East Jerusalem is the capital of a state called, or should be the capital of a state called Palestine. That, of course, includes the Temple Mount. Where does that come from? You know where it comes from, at least according to what I was briefed by my government. It came, for, it came from people saying it for so long that now it's become, this is what it is. But there's no piece of paper out there that says East Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinians. And I got to speak in front of the UN Security Council about this, where with State Department approval and the National Security Council approval, I was able to say that the aspiration of Palestinians for East Jerusalem as the capital is not a right. But Europe and the United Nations and others keep saying East Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinians. Where does that come from? Let's talk about uh, the presidential visit. Uh, U.S. President uh, Joe Biden was here in Israel. One of the things that we heard from him is that the, in the ceremony when he came to the Ben Gurion airport, he said, I understand, uh, I don't remember exactly the words, but I understand that the Palestinian state, the two-state solution is not going to happen. Were you surprised by that, by that, how he said it out clear? So I didn't see that particular thing, but the message that I took from his visit was, at the moment, first of all, he does support this, does support this phrase, two-state solution, which I'm against using, because that means the different, different things to so many different people. Mm -hmm. It's way too short to understand the complexity of the conflict. I never use it because it means nothing. What I think he said is now is not the time to engage in peace efforts, and I do agree with him on that. But you feel and you know from behind the scenes that there is pressure? from his administration, from uh, the current uh, people that are sitting today in Washington, that yes, we should proceed towards this uh, two-state solution, the Palestinian state, establishment of the Palestinian state? I think they made their public comments about, you know, it should be a two-state solution. I don't know if they went back to the old talking points of based on that so-called 67 borders and this and that. I don't know of any pressure, but I'm not in the room, so I don't want to guess and, you know, wonder whether he's putting pressure on Israel. I don't know. So from the statements, from the declarations, how do you summarize the Biden visit to Israel with also a different government? I think you can't do that without also talking about the visit to Ramallah. So on an overall basis, let's leave the Ramallah out for a minute, and the East Jerusalem Hospital Network, I thought it was a good visit. I thought uh, President Biden does appear to be a supporter of Israel. He's a Zionist. Um, I think him meeting at Yad Vashem and speaking to the survivors was really, really touching and important, and I think that was good. But then you have to think about Iran. I think there's no question that he and Prime Minister Lapid are part on this. You know, President Biden believes diplomacy with the Iranian regime will work. Uh, Prime Minister Lapid, who's not a hawk, was very clear he does nothing um, negotiations. There seems with to be a consensus in Israel already. Right. And using these words, you know, we all agree Iran can't have a nuclear weapon. Well, obviously, that's, you know, that's like learning the letter A in the alphabet. But what does that mean? It means nothing. 
I think Israel is apart from America on this. I think the region is apart from America on this. I don't think America is relying on the Europeans much to our detriment and to the detriment of Israel and its Arab neighbors. But uh, some people, let's say for, from the Trump administration or for the Republican side, say, look at the situation today, and they could say, we told you so, it's getting so uh, dangerous, Iran is getting the, the uh, nuclear plan is developing. But many are also saying that Trump, when he f took a himself, took America out of the plan, out of the agreement, he created this void where now uh, 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 Iran is developing and has developed so much. They blame Trump for what we're seeing today. Well, first of all, that assumes that the Iranians were in compliance with the agreement, which they weren't, and I think the Israelis proved that. They had this incredible mission right out of a made-for-television uh, episode showing how Iran was cheating. But let's just assume for a second Iran wasn't cheating. All the Iran deal was kick the can down the road for several years, so you would tell your kids, or I would tell my kids, look, we halted it for a couple of years, and then we gave Iran complete freedom to get a nuclear weapon. That's separate, of course, from the money that Iran got, which it uses to foment terrorism, attacks on Israel from Hamas, potential attacks from Hezbollah, a Houthi terrorist attacks on Saudi and the UAE. So the problem with what happened with Trump is that there wasn't enough runway. And the Europeans were, I don't want to say cheating, because they didn't do anything illegal, but the Europeans weren't respecting the sanctions. They want to make money from Iran. So it was like a leaky thing. You couldn't actually pressure Iran enough because there wasn't enough agreement on the sanctions and on what President Trump did. I don't think they gave it a fair shake. So let's continue with the, the visit. You mentioned, you put aside for a second the visit to Ramallah and East Jerusalem, but that had a message. A very strong message. The fact that President Biden went to the East Jerusalem hospital without Israelis shows to me that he believes that East Jerusalem some portion of it, all of it, belongs to the Palestinians. It's inconsistent with U.S. law, with the Jerusalem Recognition Act. It's either violation of the law, at least in spirit. This, this is part of Israel. If one day there's a negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians, and Israel and the Palestinians agree on something relating to Jerusalem, that's fine. But at the moment, Israel has sovereignty over Jerusalem. That's part of Jerusalem. It's part of Israel. And it's a real shame that he went there without Israeli officials. Okay, now let's continue to Saudi Arabia. Some would say that visit is part of the spirit of Abraham Accords. Uh, many uh, uh, officials, American officials, are still talking about the Abraham Accords, of course. But the fact that the Saudis said, no, we, we don't want to continue, we don't want to proceed unless we see the, the solution of the Palestinian problem, is that, that brings us back to your myths. Are the Saudis taking a step back, or were they always with that opinion, that agenda? Well, first of all, we should give the Saudis a lot of credit for their decision to allow flyover rights. I think that's extremely meaningful to Israel. It happens to be on the board of El Al, and I know it's going to save a lot of money, a lot of time for its passengers and all airlines that will fly over. <coughs> so I think they need to get a lot of credit. I don't think their public messaging is different, other than they're not putting forth, like, long lists of demands to the Palestinians. They're saying, very respectfully, look, we support the Palestinian people. We would like to see a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, and Israel is part of the region, and we want Israel to be part of the region. But they're not yet ready to sign the Abraham Accords. I still call them a country who one day will. I think it's inevitable. But I think we need to respect their time and their space. They are working on a lot of things. They're change, uh, MBS is changing the country. And Israel is only one aspect of what he has to change. Now let's uh, just go back to the Abraham Accords and maybe the stage before. And the big question that so many people are asking, and there have been so many answers, were the Abraham Accords, uh, instead of the sovereignty plan in Judea and Samaria, of what we saw Netanyahu declaring, saying statements after uh, the uh, deal of the century was presented, did it come instead? I don't think it came instead. I think what was very important to focus on is the words that they used. Uh, I think they, were, they used the word suspend. They didn't say not, they didn't say forever. And I think they were very careful, intentionally so. I think it made sense at the time, look, I'm a supporter of the application of Israeli law or extension of sovereignty over Judea and Samaria, or at least those parts that we put forth in the peace plan released by President Trump. But I do think Prime Minister Netanyahu made the absolute right decision to get the Abraham Accords and temporarily pause that decision, which I'm not sure the Israeli public is ready for yet anyway. I think that was very, very smart of Prime Minister Netanyahu. By the way, I saw that you were in uh, Hebron today. Uh, did you declare sovereignty there? <laughs> I was. I'm here with CPAC. We did a tour, and there were two things that I think are important lessons to the people that were on the tour, and I hope a much wider audience. So first of all, the person who gave us a tour was um, able to point out to us what I call Palestinian settlements, and I touch on this in the book. Everybody is always critical 
of the Israeli settlements. I don't like to call them settlements. I call them cities, towns, and neighborhoods. I think people should stop using that word because it's become a negative word. Nobody talks about Palestinian building. There's Palestinian building all over the place, largely funded by Europeans. I don't know why that's not part of the conversation. That was en route to Hebron. Hebron itself, there, you know, UNESCO claims it's not a Jewish heritage site. Any person with a brain in their head just has to go there to understand what's going on. That's one of the myths. There is so much misinformation or outright, outright outrageous fabrication. So I would encourage anyone who wants to understand Israel, who's an Israel supporter, to go to Hebron, go to the cave of the patriarchs and the matriarchs, Marat HaMachbelah, and understand the truth. And on the ride there, you have a good book that they could read. Yes, In the Path of Abraham. Thank you. Okay, Jason Grima, thank you very much. Thank you so much.